Hey everybody, it's Gomladex, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we're going to be playing another premiere draft of Wilds of Eldraine. Without further ado, let's get into the pack one pick one, which is a pretty easy pick between Lord Skitter's Butcher and Hatching Plans. Hatching Plans being a much more narrow card, though, that also sends us into the weakest color in the format immediately. You have to take a bunch of bargain cards to go with it, and you have to take a bunch of blue cards to go with it, so pretty narrow and not really where I want to be. We'll be taking the Lord Skitter's Butcher, which works excellently in every black deck. For pick two, another card that's a really flexible black spell. Actually, not that flexible, since it's not going to do much if you can't kill a creature with it. But basically, every deck in this format should be playing some amount of mana value, two or less creatures, as any deck in any draft format should be doing. So this ends up being a nice two or three for one removal spell, depending on how much you value the food token and the wicked roll token. So... We'll be taking that, another sweet uncommon. Some decent commons here like Grand Ball Guest, Conceited Witch, Spear Guard, but Witch's Vanity is easily the pick. I've never gotten Baluna Grand Squall to do anything or seen it do anything for my opponents. And now that I've got a little 20 second break here, I do want to do a quick update. Uh, if you've been watching the Twitch streams or you've been listening to what I've been saying in some of the videos, you will know that I expected to be done with Wilds of Eldraine by now. Today's video was supposed to be chromatic cube draft so my apologies about that but the schedule that wizards posted on the magic arena weekly announcements for the past two weeks is apparently not accurate we still don't know exactly when chromatic cube drafts are going to go live but as of the recording today on november 2nd when they said they'd go live they're still not on Arena, so at least one more Wilds of Eldraine premiere draft here before we get into the Chromatic Cube, but as soon as those go live on Arena, I'll be hopping headfirst into those. Just a big question mark as to when that's going to happen right now. For pack one, pick three, we've got a Ratcatcher Trainee or a Twisted Fealty for really solid aggressive options, pushing into red as a secondary color, and I'm much happier to take one of those than our on-color commons here, because both of these are kind of weak kind of narrow. I think I would rather just take the Rat Catcher Trainee here. I do like Twisted Fealty, but I think between Twisted Fealty and Ariette's Tempting Apple, they're slightly replaceable because they're kind of the type of cards that I don't really want to run like three plus copies of. I only really want one or two as like a top end finisher. Whereas Rat Catcher Trainee, I will run like infinite copies of little two, three mana creatures, ways to get creatures on the board, stuff like that. So We'll take the Rat Catcher Trainee over the Active Treason effect there. For pick four, things are significantly weaker in red and black now. None of these cards are cards that I find to be super high picks for red or black archetypes, and they're honestly pretty late picks overall. We can take a Ginger Brute, which is pretty nice when you slap a roll onto it. The best when you put a Young Hero roll onto it and get multiple plus one plus one counters on it, but even just putting a Wicked roll on it can be fine. I guess we can go Ginger Brute here, stick to aggro stuff, but Sheree and Baluna's Gatekeeper for more controlling, slower, grindier blue decks are also powerful cards. For pack one, pick five, I am going to take Edgeball in. Well, this is a little bit of competition with the Ariat's Tempting Apple here, and uh, this is part of why I didn't take the other Act of Trees in effect, since there's also apples in the format we can take as big finishers that just hit our opponent for so much extra damage. I think I'm still going to take Edgewall in because this thing fits into literally every deck I've ever drafted in the format. Even if you're aggressive, the fact that you can sacrifice this later to bring back a rat catcher trainer or something gives it enough extra value to justify having a tap land in your deck. And of course, it mana fixes you. And if you're a slower deck, having a mana fixing tap land is already going to be good. Plus that extra value of picking up an adventure creature later is uh is just super excellent so i really like taking edge wall in incredibly highly because i basically never cut it from my deck no matter how the draft ends up going for pick six we've got a pretty filler two drop creature here the boundary lands ranger obviously it's pretty great when you've got a power four or greater creature on the board you're just not going to have that all the time unless you are specifically the red green archetype in the format so mostly a two mana two two but sometimes we get to Get some card selection off of it, discarding lands late game to try to draw some non-lands. Pick 7 shows us some incredible black commons still hanging out. This late in the draft, a Hopeless Nightmare and a Sweet Tooth Witch. Hopeless Nightmare is tremendously good bargain fodder, and it gives you something to do with your mana turn 1. 
which is also pretty spectacular. I'm going to take it over Sweet Tooth Witch here, but that card is also quite, quite strong. Uh, Gale Fang's a pretty solid green card, but we're not jumping off color for that when we have black commons that are honestly just as good. All right, pick eight is where things are drying up. I'd say the best card is probably Diminisher Witch for, again, slower, more controlling blue decks. You get to kind of stun a creature from your opponent with that bargain roll. I guess this is the one that doesn't actually like tap it and put a cursed roll onto it. But with bargaining, getting your roll off this thing, you get to, I guess, nullify their creature, make it a little 1-1 one -one thing. I think I still take it because it's the best card, but we could just take the filler Wicked Visitor. It also maybe keeps people off black. I don't know. I guess we'll take the Wicked Visitor just in case I don't find enough good two drop creatures. This pack is again very empty. We'll just take the on color filler equipment there. And pick 10, Grand Ball Guest, I think is a better card than anything we've seen in the past couple packs. So pretty happy to have that. It synergizes really well with Rat Catcher Training and Lord Skitter's Butcher. These are both spells that we can cast on turn three to have two permanents hit the board off of one spell get that buff going, get the three power trample damage in, and I'm super, super happy to be in red in this draft pod, because we just get that Twisted Fealty right back, we get our Active Treason as a big finisher spell. Pick 12 now, slap a Raid Bombardment in the side just to cut people off red, but it's highly unlikely I'll end up playing that card. You need a very, very, very large amount of power one and two creatures, and even then, a little hard to justify over just slamming down like a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three on turn 3. So pack 2, pick 1. We have a Feed the Cauldron, a Rat Out, and a Gnawing Crescendo. Ash is also pretty good, but I've got some pretty excellent black spells. I mean, only 3 of them that are really good, which is Vanity, Hopeless, Nightmare, and Butcher. But I think that's a solid enough reason um, to still be sort of sticking to black at this point. I mean, we're not missing a whole ton by speculating on an Ash here, but Rat Out is pretty dang efficient. Gnawing Crescendo is very nice to have, like, one copy of in most of the really go wide aggro decks. Don't think I love Feed the Cauldron here. I'll just take a Rat Out. I'm not super in love with that pack as a whole. And this pack as well is also pretty weak, but I think we can scoop up the Stab Wound this time around, be a little happier with that. Kind of a flexible removal spell where it's going to kill their low toughness cards, and if they have a high toughness card and you want to just keep chipping away at them for some damage, you can have this do that as well. So that can be nice. Pick three is a pretty easy belligerent to the ball, but there's also an apple, a grand ball guest, a hopeless nightmare, beautiful, beautiful packs. Uh, but we're doing great on scooping up a lot of two drop stuff to do, so I do have room for another three mana creature. I'm going to sort all of my um, non-creatures out of here. Actually, I'm sorting all the cards that I won't be casting on that turn out of here. So Hopeless Nightmare, I still treat it as a one-drop, because if I just have a Swamp and nothing else to do, I'm just going to go Swamp Hopeless Nightmare turn one. So the really important thing about your mana curve is when are you casting your spells? What turn are you casting your spells? Because that is the curve of how the game is actually going to play out. So if you have, for example a rat out, you're basically never going to cast that turn one, so I just stack it in this separate pile, and this is like the pile of stuff that we just cast whenever we specifically need it, and that's not going to help uh, determine what our mana curve looks like overall for making sure that we're casting spells throughout the game. Uh, pick four is a super weak pack for everybody except the green player, getting that storm killed vanguard, GG, green players. We can get a screen puff for a filler top end card, or another Ginger Brute, I guess. Vampiric Rites is cute, but pretty dang slow. We've got another Grand Ball Guest competing with Minstrosity and Conceited Witch. I'll take another Grand Ball Guest. Definitely sticking heavier to red than black. There's a Tempting Apple competing with Spear Guard. I'm just going to take the One Drop Dork. Again, I don't love having a million um, steel effects in my decks. I'm pretty cool with just one or two, like a Twisted Fealty. The problem is if you draw too many, um, if you draw too many like steel effects, non-creature spells in general, you don't have enough creatures to get the follow through to get the damage you need going. Kind of similar to gnawing crescendo, 
right? The more gnawing crescendos and twisted fealties and Ariette's tempting apples you have in your deck, the more likely you are to get an opening hand that has like one creature, a gnawing crescendo, and two active treasons, which is just a death sentence. All right, definitely take a conceited witch here, pick eight. So again, they're really, really powerful cards, but you really do not want to hit them until you're at that point in the game where you're closing things out. Well, we get that gnawing crescendo to come right back. We'll scoop it up. Does look like it's going to be one of those drafts where our entire third pack can be dedicated to improving the deck. Probably got to focus up on that creature count. 11 creatures, definitely a bit small for an aggro deck. So, yep, just looking to find some premium creatures at whatever mana costs. If we're lucky, though, we find some kind of four or five mana bomb to be the top end of our curve. We don't need a lot of four or five mana stuff to do in an aggressive deck like this, but it would be nice to have like something big. The absolute dream would be that we open up like the red cap gutter dweller, the four mana, three, three menace that comes with two rats. Be the perfect way to top off our curve. Do get the tempting apple to come back. And we are at that critical mass now with a non crescendo and a twisted fealty and a tempting apple that it's very, very unlikely that all three of these are going to make the cut. And we 100% don't even want to take another copy of any of them. Unless there's absolutely nothing left in the pack. Anything in a sideboard that's playable? Nah, I guess Fell Horseman is a creature. We need to get that creature count up. Okay, pack three, pick one. Well, it's not a bomb rare, but it is a card that's super solid for this kind of deck. One mana for a 3-2, but you have to put a curse roll on one of your creatures to play it. There's two ways to get around this. One of them is to bargain away the curse roll, which our deck is horrific at doing. We don't have a single bargain spell yet. The other way to get around it is to curse a 1-1, one, one, and that we're actually pretty capable of doing. We have three 1-mana one 1-1s, one, and we've also got one or two ways to make rat tokens with, like, rat catcher training or a spear guard replacing itself, so... With a few more rat-producing cards, we should be able to throw that curse rule onto a 1-1 one, one relatively consistently. And speaking of trying to get a few more rat-producing cards, I'm pretty happy to take a Voracious Vermin here, we have multiple cards that have pretty powerful celebration triggers, two Grand Ball Guests and one Belligerent to the Ball. So this card single-handedly triggering celebration while giving us another rat for that Spiteful Hex Mage is pretty nice. I also like Minstrosity as a two-drop and Two-Headed Hunter as a finisher. Those are fine too, but I think Vermin hits some pretty powerful synergies for this deck. Pack three, pick three. We can go ahead and take a Hopeless Nightmare, but... I think with our lack of top end and our lack of bargain making Hopeless Nightmare a much less exciting card, I'm just going to take the kind of filler finisher of the two-headed hunter. Should play out pretty fine for us. Ooh, well, now we are going to be perfectly happy to play both of our active trees and effects, because now we might luck sack into the beautiful play of stealing an opponent's creature and then also sacrificing their creature to blow up another one of their creatures, so stealing a creature and flinging it at your opponent always going to be pretty powerful. Um, but the only issue is that this card is significantly worse when we don't have it with an act of treason. It's not that great by itself, but we're still definitely taking it there. Get another rat out here. I suppose we could treat rat outs as creatures in this deck for hitting that creature count, because we can use 1-1s one aggressively to poke in for some amount of damage. So, kind of like we're at an 18 creature count, 16 plus double rat out at this point. Not bad at all. Ooh, another hopeless nightmare. It's pretty exciting, but again, with the lack of bargain, I think I do prefer Spearguard. I just love getting in for that little haste damage and... Once your opponent has a big enough board that they can just block this thing and uh, kill it, it makes sure that you're still attacking with like just as many creatures on the next attack because it replaces itself when it dies. 
I do like it a lot. Speaking of cards I like a lot, there's a Minstrosity. This is not a deck that needs a big Shatter the Oath 5 mana removal spell, because once we hit that point in the game, we're going to randomly kill our opponent with a Crescendo, or we're just going to steal their big creature and kill them with it, with a field to your attempting apple. So keep that curve low, get some more creatures in here, grab the Minstrosity. Take another Grand Ball Ghast here. Flick a coin is tempting. It's a pretty great card, but we do have double Rat Out fiddling filling a pretty similar role. We don't draw a card off Rat Out, but it's also significantly less mana to cast. And they're very similar, just really good at clearing out 1-1s one or finishing off larger creatures that have already been dealt damage. Uh, Merry Bards is definitely better than Fell Horseman in this deck, so I will take it here and probably play it. It triggers Celebration by itself, so it's great with the Belligerent and Triple Ball Ghast. It's also great with the Double Ginger Brute, putting a young hero roll onto one of those getting a large unblockable threat. We get a pick 10 Witch's Mark for some card draw if we need it. Throw an Unruly Catapult to the sideboard. And grab a third Rat Out. I don't know if we're going to main deck three Rat Outs here. I think two would be fine for this deck, but we do have too many playables, so we'll have to make some decisions here. We're definitely not going to run double Witch's Mark. Or a Johan stopgap. I guess we could theoretically do it off an edge ball in splash, but absolutely not going to happen here. All right, so we've got 47 cards. We've got a pretty excellent curve all around, and the two drop slot is super, super, super full when you consider there's three copies of Grand Ball Guest. The one drop slot also incredibly full. Five one drop creatures and three rat outs for more potential one drop creatures. So we got to make some room here. We have one young hero roll for the Ginger Brutes. They could wear a Battle Garb, but again, this card is pretty weak without the Ginger Brutes. Trying to put this on like a specific card that's getting in for damage. We do have a few Wicked Rolls. I've got one from a Conceited Witch. Got one from a Twisted Fealty. One from a Witch's Mark, but... I don't actually think Ginger Brute is looking super good in here, and we'll certainly cut the Bespoke Battle Garb with that sort of Ginger Brute package. Um, Merry Bards I might still enjoy just filling out that 4-drop slot alongside Conceited Witch, potentially. Um, but Ginger Brute, I think, probably not quite making the cut here. Another thing we can do here, again, with this mountain of 2-mana stuff to do is cut the more filler ones. We love the Rat Catcher. Yeah, if you look at just our good ones, we have three Grand Ball Guests, Rat Catcher Trainee, uh, Minstrosity, and a Callus Cellsword. We have a lot of, like, great two-drops. You can cut the more filler uh, Wicked Visitor for sure, although we do have a couple Wicked Rolls, which is fine, but I think cutting Wicked Visitor is still fine. And then Boundary Lands Ranger, I think we only have one card with power four or greater, so this is a two-mana two-two with no text. And this curve still looks pretty great. That's still three one-mana creatures, six two-mana creatures, and triple rat out fitting in there somewhere. Even if we drop down to double rat out, I think that's plenty of early game action, even for a pretty aggressive deck like this. So I'm going to cut these two. And then we can cut two more cards to wrap things up. Maybe, again, I've been saying, talking about the triple rat out a lot here. That does feel a bit high. We're on 15 creatures and two rat out. I think that's probably okay. And then I could cut a land here. Average mana value 2.3. Even if I don't hit five mana for two headed hunter, I can still use it as a double strike and combat trick for two mana. Even if I don't hit four mana for Mary Bards, I can play a three mana three two. I won't be happy about it, but I can cast it in the worst case scenario. And Conceited Witch is not really a 4-mana spell, because every now and then I'll just have a 1-drop on board and nothing to do turn 2, so I'll be like, okay, I'll put a Wicked Roll on that. Or maybe turn 3, I'll have another 2-drop in hand and 1-mana left over, so I'll play another creature and play the Wicked Roll then. There are plenty of ways to play a Conceited Witch as a 3-mana, 2-3-menace, while still having gotten the Wicked Roll value. You don't have to cast both the Adventure and the Creature in one turn, so that, again, helps the curve out in really only having one card that needs four mana to do something. Everything else does at least something at three or less mana, even if it's not ideal, even if it's just a double strike trick or just a three two. We only have one spell that cannot be used whatsoever. 
without uh, four plus mana. So let's cut a land here. And we've got 12 red cards, 11 black. We've got two one mana black plays, Hex Mage and Nightmare, and two one mana red plays of Double Spear Guard. Rat out, gonna be cast turn one much less frequently than those, but we could count these as one more. We'll say like three black spells that want to be cast turn one and two red spells. As for two mana, there are four of them that want to be cast to turn two, and only 2.5 that want to be cast in black. That still adds up to being pretty even, right? Like three plus two and a half, that's like 5.5 black spells at two mana or less. And for red, it is six. Astronomically close between the colors. Do I have any double red or any double black? Certainly don't. Well, I guess I'll probably just go red here for the eight and black for the seven. Just feel like up here in the creature curve, there's definitely a bit more red than black, and we need to get our creatures down immediately to curve out aggressively. The spells like hope, like a uh, well, yeah, hopeless nightmare counts too. The rat out and the hopeless nightmares don't need to be cast turn one to be as effective as possible because it's not like you're trying to get rid of their summoning sickness or have them deal damage turn after turn. I mean, I guess rat out certainly does, sort of does, certainly <laughs> rat out certainly does because of getting the rat token. But with hopeless nightmare, it really. Technically hits just as hard. We cast it any time later. It's just nice to get the man investment out immediately. So yeah, I guess we're just gonna do that. Cut a 16th, cut a 17th land, and uh call it a deck here. Alright, here's a look at our final deck list for today. We're on another red black aggro deck. We've just got a good aggressive curve of creatures and some pretty simplistic stuff going on, as you can expect. From aggressive decks in Wilds of Eldraine, we're just curving out, maybe triggering Celebration by playing uh, two rats in one turn, or I guess technically Voracious Vermin's also playing two rats in one turn, just one of them is a vermin and not just a rat token. So getting some Celebration extra damage in with Grand Ball Guests and Belligerents and stuff, and then after we've curved out well, chipped in for a bunch of damage, steal our opponent's biggest blocker they're trying to use to stabilize, and kill them with it. Very basic stuff, stuff we've done a million times before, and I thought we were finally moving on to more formats, but there's no cube on Arena like we were promised right now, so we'll see. Still gonna play it out, still gonna try to get as many wins as I can in this format until they put the chromatic cube drafts on, but uh, for now, this is what we got, this is what we're stuck with. Let's just play the final, final, final Wilds of Eldraine premiere draft, question mark? We'll see. All right, here we are on the draw for game one. Definitely a keepable hand mana-wise. Get the Hopeless Nightmare man investment out of here and roll from there. Our opponent is on green and black and they have discarded a torch the tower, so they're on green, black, and red. Just gonna run out our cell sword and get damage in while we can. We do not have any other creatures to jam out, so we need to be getting the damage in that we can off this thing. A little sad to not keep it around for potential active trees in effect later, but it is what it is. This is the hand that we've been dealt. And our opponent has the turn two Witcher's Vanity, which is gross. Kill the callous cell sword, get a food. And a potential Wicked roll as well. Here's an Evolving Wilds for red from our opponent. Conceded which is the play. So if we want to stop them from getting a Wicked roll, I'm going to have to spend Stab Wound and Rat Out on the Conceded Witch. And I don't have double black, so I can't even do that, regardless. 
I guess I could send in the Spear Guard, and if they block, then Stab Wound kills it. If they don't block, I can still put a Stab Wound on it. Just start draining them for life. Okay. Better to Stab Wound here than just play a Ball Guest. I feel like it is. That starts damaging them immediately. Drawn to a spiteful hex mage now. Solid draw with a 1 1 on board. I think I can just play a ball guest here. I'm not really going to be trying to defensively use my double strike combat trick. Sounds like it would be a bad idea against a bunch of open mana. There's a Boundary Lands Ranger, no four power creature to go with it. So for now, we're just going to keep draining them out with Stab Wound, it looks like. And I can drop a Minstrosity and have the Double Strike trick up. But again, I would really rather not try to use it defensively when they have mana up for their own tricks. So we're just hanging out. Candy Grapple a Hex Mage, fair enough. the voracious vermin for our opponent and they're going to get a 2-1 rat so that keeps getting bigger and a 1-1 rat token find a witch's vanity don't actually think that's particularly good on this board now that we have the black mana back up do I just want to rat out a vermin before they untap I don't hate it Obviously not getting any attacks in here, but as long as that stab wound keeps sitting there, we are still getting damage in. Let's go for it. Rat out of vermin is just as good a target as any. And move on from there. Now that the vermin's been ratted out, we can Witch's Vanity the Boundary Lands Ranger if we want to. Without buffing the vermin out of range of our rat out. I think that'd probably be fine, clear the path a little more. So our opponent has a bargained Rowan's Grim Search here. Look at the top four, they can mill any number of those and then they get to draw two and lose two. So if there's good cards in their top four, they keep whichever ones they want and draw into them. But if not, surveil four, draw two, digs pretty deep. All right, they are gonna mill a Witch's Vanity and a Collector's Vault to draw the other two cards, so they are probably pretty good. Callus Sellsword, that is beautiful for our opponent here. Actually perfect. Because it gets rid of the stab wound and kills one of our creatures. Alright. That is not great for me. Another red source, not even another black source here. Opponent's at 6, and they don't have the ability. To eat their food right now. So if I Witch's Vanity a Boundary Lands Ranger, they block a Grand Ball Guest and take 3. It's still nowhere near killing them. If I could somehow trigger Celebration this turn as well, then maybe we could get there, but... I cannot... Witch's Vanity is one non-land permanent. 
So we might have to just play a 5-4 Menace and pass. They are going to have time to gain that life. Guaranteed here. Yeah, I mean, otherwise, the, the alternative is lose the ball guess to hit them for three, then they go back up to six. And we only have two one ones on the board. I think we actually just need to play the 5 4 menace. Which is not ideal. So we know they kept another spell that was not a Callous Cell Sword. That they thought was better than Collector's Vault and Witch's Vanity. So it might just be a removal spell big enough to kill our 5 4 Menace. But I suppose we will find out soon enough. Yeah, they're going to pass turn. Holding all that mana up. Well, can make it so they only have one blocker up against our menace creature. They're probably just killing it with one for one removal at instant speed anyway, but... This makes the onboard attack free. And I think we send in with everybody because we can trigger celebration at instant speed so that ball guest trades up into the horseman. Uh, and then we still get some damage in, even if they, like, tap out to uh, exile the two-headed hunter or something. I am not going to trigger Celebration until they are tapped out here. Yeah, it is the, the exile removal spell. All right. So let's get the Celebration and eat the horseman. All right. They're down to four. They're low enough on mana that... Eating the food does stop them from playing more creatures, so while they can technically be at basically 7, it would be at the detriment of not playing blockers, well not playing as many blockers, or as big blockers, to do so. We have exact lethal on boards, so they have to play something to block or just hold up the mana for food, but they can do both because they can play the cell sword and eat the food at worst would not be a bad turn for them. I have the mana to sacrifice Hopeless Nightmare during my upkeep and play Ratcatcher in the same turn, so I'm going to put the stop there so I've got that option. Ooh, yeah, if there are other creatures Barrow Naughty, that might be worth it. I don't know if there's any way I could hit lethal, though, because I'd only have two mana up after I sack the Hopeless Nightmare. Do I have any two mana spells that find lethal? Witch's Mark does not, Grand Ball Guest does not, Spear Guards and a Rat Out do not. But I have three and four mana spells that could find lethal here. I could find Twisted Fealty, Ariette's Tempting Apple, Gnawing Crescendo. So I need to not scry so that if I do top deck one of the lethal spells, we can just cast it here. Okay, I didn't actually do the math if this was lethal. I was just like, this might be lethal. It was on my list. Um, so we steal Cell Sword. They block that. Take four. It is lethal. It is lethal. Yeah, it's lethal either way since they don't have the mana to eat their food. Okay. That was a lot closer than it looked. I mean, obviously we had the life total lead by a whole ton, but we were just top decking in the end there. We had to keep hitting straight gas. We had the hopeful nightmare, so whenever we ran out of things to do with our mana, we could scry to make sure that we keep drawing well, but I don't think it would have taken too much for our opponent to be able to stabilize there. Although, that is part of what makes getting a really wide board state of rats so nice is that does take a lot of blockers to stop all those last few points of damage. So we are going to start things off 1-0 as we head into game two. Here we are now for game two on the draw again. We have Spear Guard into Cell Sword into Conceited Witch, if nothing else. Uh, we might go for something else because with all these adventures we can change up the curve ourselves. We could go Wicked Roll turn two instead of 
Cell sword, I could go wicked roll plus fling if I want to do that, but with the apple in hand, probably not. I think this is the main reason we probably want a wicked roll turn two is the fact that we have the apple for the cell sword. This lets me go wicked roll this turn and then just play the two three menace next turn and save our fling effect for turn five because we need four mana to use the apple and one to use the fling. I'd be pretty happy with this trade, but if our opponent has a nice defensive hand with some late game Hamlet gluttons and stuff, then uh, they might be happy with the trade too, and they do. They go for it. So our 2-2 has been downgraded to a 1-1, but we cleared out their 2-2, so we'll take it. No creature this turn. All right. Creature's mark, not a bad draw. I've got multiple adventure creatures, so I do want to play the edge ball in as a tap land this turn, but I think I'll discard a swamp draw too. Um, I think I want to get a little cheaty face with Arena here and see if Arena stops at all for our opponent, because that's a lot of open mana involving double red as well. So if they have a flick a coin or a torch the tower and I try to put a wicked roll on this rat, they counter the card draw as well, which would be horrific for me. So if Arena stops for my opponent at all, I'm not going to do it, but it didn't stop for them whatsoever, so I'm going to put the Wicked Roll on this. And hope they aren't playing me for a fool. They are not. So that is one of the perks of playing Digital Magic in a non-sarcastic way there. Sometimes you get to cheat a little bit and gather extra information you're really not supposed to have. Which, I used to hate doing that a lot, but then my justification now is that, well, everyone can do that, so people are definitely doing it against me. I should probably start using that information against opponents as well. So, a 3-4 is an annoying block. We'll probably just applet and throw it next turn, but for now, I guess I just play my best threat, most man efficient card. It's going to marry bards with the roll on it. Worst case scenario, this can also just attack into the Tempest Heart if they don't play a 5 mana value spell. And the Tempest Heart is just large enough to trade with Mary bards. Yeah, for the longest time, first two or three years that I played Arena, I really hated... That was one of my least favorite things about Arena is that you could gather that kind of information to see if Arena's auto-stopping or holding for your opponent to check if they have instants or not, combat tricks and stuff like that. Still don't like it, but I've just accepted that it is a part of the Arena metagame. Really, it's, it's a part of what you should be paying attention to and what people are definitely paying attention to against you so here comes like a cut in or something Porsche tower okay Ooh, Arth elemental is super good oh i have a fealty and a tempting apple now okay so i can play ball guest conceded which this turn Hope they go for a crack back with that Tempest Heart. And then I can play whatever kind of active trees and I want next turn and throw their Beanstalk Worm at them. Or throw it at their other blocker. Ooh. Gingerbread Hunter. That comes with a food. It's going to be real nice. And then Hearth Elemental number two to discard the empty hand and draw two more. Their deck is getting straight value here. Okay, so three mana for this, plus one to fling and two to play the cell sword. Yeah, that's better than playing the apple right now. I think they're still just gonna lose because of all of our active treasons, but they've got some fancy stuff going on that's pretty cool. I hit for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If I throw this at Tempest Heart, and five if I just attack with it, so let's throw it at the Tempest Heart. Because I hit harder that way. 
Oh, I forgot to trigger the celebration. Oh, I'm a doofus. We should have hit for one more damage. Which might matter. Probably not. Again, because Tempting Apple, but we'll see. We have two Wicked Rolls on our board as well. Alright. Oh yeah, those things cost two mana now. They can double Hearth Elemental and eat a food. So they're at 11, basically. If they're at 11 life and they block Hearth Elemental, they still take 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Could matter. Probably not. They would need a 1 mana spell for it to matter. Because I can still just throw the food at them after I hit them. Um, but if I got that extra point of damage last turn, I would not have had thrown the food at them. And yeah, if they have Torch the Tower, I think they still die. Witch Stalker Frenzy, though. Don't kill something with a Wicked Roll on it and stop three more damage? I think that actually does it. That makes it matter. Right, block there, take three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, no, they're gonna be at one life after the dust settles here. Which they pr probably still lose because I have two wicked rolls on the board and they have to block these to not take damage, which means they take damage from a wicked roll. But if they have more food production or something, they could uh, they could still die here. Or five, six, seven. They have to go for eat the food right now. Yeah, because if they try to do it later, then I can uh, throw the apple at them in response. So that they die. Yep, they're just going to be at one life against multiple wicked roll wearing dorks. Oh, that miss of the celebration. We have given them an extra turn to draw into an out here. There's the Garuk's Uprising to draw another card and dig for it. it. It's pretty much gotta be life gain. Oh my god. And there's another food. <laughs> so it's life gain. I guess thanks to Edge Wall in, it is still pretty unlikely to matter. But wow, we have really set ourselves up for failure here. We've given them some some turns. Well, we give them a turn to draw a card. And that has been enough. If we give them like another turn to draw a card, this is super bad. Or if their hand's good enough that it gives them another turn. Which it might be. So they're saving two mana to eat a food. But if that's the only thing they're doing here... Then I can edge wall in and fling my conceited witch at them for the last point of damage. They're at one life. I guess I could just edge wall and fling guest at them right now. Just don't even attack with it. Because it hits for four if I don't attack with it, and one if I do. I guess, yeah, that's probably for the best. And then we make it so they need instant speed removal to stop this. If they have instant speed removal, though, they're good. All right, that was way sketchier than it needed to be. A very, very simple mistake of just not playing my creature and triggering the celebration. I guess maybe I just thought I'd already triggered celebration because I'd like stolen a creature and put a permanent on the board. But it's like stealing a creature doesn't mean that you've put an online permanent on your board. That was 
way, way, way sketchier than it needed to be. And again, they could have had um, the outs there if they had another, like, Torch the Tower, Sack the Uprising, Torch the Tower, our Grand Ball Guest before our Fling resolves. Because of the way that this one is worded, where it needs to have your target creature on the board to deal the damage. If somebody kills your creature before your burn together resolves, then they do stop the damage. So we gave them some opportunities to live there off of just a silly little minor sequencing error, not finding the celebration trigger for that one extra point of damage. So it is a win in the end, but a sketchy one there. 2-0 heading into game three. Here we are for game three on the draw for the third time in a row. We're going to be playing a turn two Grand Ball Guest and going from there. Our opponent's on red-white, but no plays turn one or turn two. Not the most expected thing for the red-white decks. But there you go, they've got the grabby giant to get a treasure token at least. If they slam down a 4-3 here, we probably just put a Wicked Roll onto the Ball Guest and send it in rather than just playing the Menace card. That's going to change that plan, though, because now with Belligerent to the Ball, we can get some big Celebration Triggers next turn off of either of our three mana creatures, Conceited Witch or Merry Bards. We'll get the double Celebration going. It's going to be a whole party in here. We're getting the Glow Sticks out and everything. First, Courtier hits the board, so they're going to want to bargain away that curse roll, but once they do, that is going to be a very, very good creature for its mana cost. We find our Tempting Apple for the finisher. Um, for now, we give the Belligerent Menace, make it a 4-3 Menace, they'd have to double block, we'd kill both creatures, and we... I guess just Wicked Roll up the Ball Guest, make it a 3-3 base stats, 4-4 Trample here on the attack. I mean, there's no better creature to put a young hero roll onto than the Grand Ball Guest, though, so I guess I just put the young hero roll onto it. But either way, I feel like it is probably just trading into Grabby Giants. I could put the young hero roll onto the Merry Bards itself. That would also be okay. Ball Guest still attacks in as a 3 3 Trampler, which is still big enough to uh, trade into the Grabby Giant. Yeah, let's do that. Let's actually do that. Put the roll on a creature that is not in danger of dying this turn. Send in the squad to see what's trading off where. Absolutely nothing. Well, they are confident that they are buffing their courtier this turn, I imagine. If they want to just take seven, that would be the safest way to go for a counterattack, if they can guarantee they've got a 3-3 lifelinker coming in. So maybe a torch the tower, bargain away the cursed roll, and kill the belligerent to the ball or something like that. Would be a pretty good turn for our opponent. Maybe that would have been a decent reason to just put a wicked roll on the belligerent, just get it out of range of uh, a torch the tower, because we know they're definitely wanting to play some amount of bargain with this card to sack that enchantment. Works out fine for us, though. They just play a Merry Bards. Now we have five mana to play around with. I could Tempting Apple their Grabby Giant and put a Wicked Roll on the board. That also triggers Celebration, which is pretty nuts. And I guess they'll get a little bit of lifelink here, but this is still a fantastic turn, I think. Let's get that ball guest out of range of the Merry Bards here. Belligerent the Menace so it doesn't trade to the Merry Bards. Probably trading Merry Bards for Merry Bards and then Courtier is going to be chomping the Grabby Giant. Probably what I would do if I was our opponent. But they could also go to one. That is an option too. Alright, yeah, they chump the Grabby Giant. Trade Bards for Bards. Go to six.
They've got four mana up now. They could have a cut in here. Think we beat a cut in? I guess not exactly, no. Because they can just still hold up their grabby giant as a blocker. They have to do that, though. Okay, rat out. Interesting. That means... I don't win... But I can trigger Celebration before the attack, which is kind of a big deal. Not before the attack, but to get the buff and the trample. And then I can do double strike trample stuff here. It means I'm not killing anything with the Witcher's Vanity, but I think it's worth it. They obviously have to block. Then we can rat out. Make that three power an R creature of 4-4, four, four. and then I can also double strike. Oh wait, no, this is lethal. This is Xaxxes. Exactly six damage gets trampled over. All right, well, that was more clever <laughs> than I thought. I thought it was just going to be solid just to be able to trample over their creature without even losing mine and then go from there, but being able to hit for exact lethal is even better, and we are now 3-0 and oh, undefeated so far as we head into game number 4. Here we are on the play for the first time today, and we are pretty happy to see that, especially with a curve like this. I'm always slightly disappointed to play a Rat Catcher Trainee turn 2 instead of getting to use its pest problem, but when I have no other spells to cast turn 2, that is always going to be what we are supposed to do. Curve out with our creatures as efficiently and aggressively as possible. Gnawing Crescendo makes me even sadder about that. Because of our ability to really get a bunch of extra damage in with a super wide board state. Alright, so here... Play Belligerent, then Butcher for Celebration next turn seems legit. Get a solid amount of value from that first strike on the Rat Catcher Trainee. Could bluff an attack with the Spear Guard. The problem is if they block, I have to rat out there, basically, and then I'm not casting a 3-drop. I think that's pretty bad. Alright, there's a Coral Smith. Another sturdy blocker over there. can trigger celebration off of butcher but they have five toughness i guess with or without celebration they probably double block belligerent to the wall right and i can rat out and make that worth my while I think we might actually just not trigger Celebration then, and just send in the team. They go for the double block on Belligerent, we rat out and kill both. Wait, no, Belligerent doesn't work like the other Celebration card, it won't get the extra power. They don't go for the double block on Belligerent anyway. Yeah, important differential, Belligerent triggers at the beginning of combat, Whereas the Grand Ball Guest just works at any time. Um, so that actually would have blown up in my face if they went for the double block. I would make their stuff four toughness against my three power attacker. This works out fine though, because we're perfectly happy to lose a spear guard. We'll rat out the Coral Smith. So in them blocking in a way that I didn't want them to block, things actually went better for me. It's just been a pretty lucky day today. <laughs> a lot of little loose things that have not been uh, not been going bad for me. Because again, going into blocks, this is not how I would have wanted them to block, because I thought I would be getting my belligerent celebration and buffing that up to four there. But uh, no. This block is way better for me than the block I wanted them to do. Leaves us with a super wide board state to just crescendo with next turn. 
And if I don't think Crescendo is going to be enough, we can just Butcher and get Celebration and go in for damage. But I imagine Crescendo is going to be insane. I mean, it's like 15 damage. If they don't block, they'll obviously block some of it, but it's still going to be a huge swing. We could just go Crescendo into giving the whole board Menace the turn after that. Thanks to the flexibility of that Lord Skitter's Butcher. I don't even have to use this just for celebration. I can use it to find lethal. A couple turns from now. Giving a bunch of 1-1's one Menace. They just hold all their mana up here. That'd be a little bit annoying. Does that mean they're just going to counter whatever we do? But if that is the case, we could just send in the first striker in the 3-3. Three, three. Okay, they do not just do that. They play a reindeer. So they're going to trade into a belligerent and a spear guard, but we'll get plenty of creatures out off crescendo and extra damage in. Yeah, we're just going to crescendo it up. We hit for 9, and then have a super big board to attack with next turn. The only way we lose, really, is if they have the uh, the board wipe, double white and 3, to destroy all creatures. Since it, it can be a one-sided board wipe, like you get to choose what power of creatures you want to kill. Um, but they have no creatures on board, so it would just be double white and 3, blow up all creatures. If they have it. But I think that's the only way they stabilize here. It wouldn't even be a way that I would say, like, we lose. It would just be uh, a way for them to maybe not die immediately. All right, and I'm guessing by them not conceding until we cast the Lord Skitter's Butcher that their game plan here was to use a Archon's Glory to give this plus two plus two and lifelink. That would explain why they didn't dump all of their mana into it. They kept the white mana up. Archon's Glory, an instant that gives plus two, plus two, flying and lifelink if you bargain away something. So they were going to sack the Hopeful Vigil, make this a four power lifelinker. Block there, take three, but gain four and stay at three life and try to stabilize from there. So it does look like the extra Lord Skitter's Butcher lying in wait was necessary. Had to get that help from Remy from Ratatouille over there. We are now 4-0 oh, heading into game five. Here we are now for game five, opponent on the play again. We've got a turn two Minstrosity and Grand Ball Guest to choose from. No celebration coming up, so we might start with Minstrosity. Kind of depends what our opponent drops out, so we'll see what they've got. They've got a forest and a bakery raid from their hollow scavenger to get a food token. Green black, that is gonna be a rough matchup for the aggressive archetypes in the format. As they can get a lot of food tokens and a lot of big creatures late game to stabilize. Luckily, we've got some good stuff against the big creatures, but uh still definitely worried about the food. Well, this could go badly for me. They could have a rat out here to kill the monstrosity and get a rat. But I'm still going to go for the Minstrosity over the Ball Guest, since we aren't triggering Celebration at all next turn anyway. This threatens to hit for three, even if we don't hit Celebration. Alright, beautiful. Now, I can Stab Wound the Scavenger just to get it out of the way. Or I could just be cool with the trade. I've got a Hex Mage with no 1-1s for it, which is kind of awkward. I'm not in love with this trade here. I think stab wounding something over the course of a few turns could be nice for that extra damage, but it's also pretty cool to just clear out something that threatens to block as a 5-4. All right, they're going to draw a couple cards, discard a couple cards off their Scan the Clouds adventure from Tempest Heart. Discarding some extra lands. Just holding up the mana to eat a food, it looks like. Awkward day for the Hex Mage. We didn't draw any 
cards that work with it still, so we're going to have to just play it as a 1-1 one -one here. Well, I guess we might as well weaken the Grand Ball Guest. Turn a 2-2 two -two into a 1-1 one -one instead of a 3-2 into a 1-1. One -one. Another Bakery Raid, another Hollow Scavenger in the hand, and that is all they do. They hold up four mana after that. Well, my spells are all just for getting more damage in, so I can't really uh, play around anything here. We just send in the team. Are they flashing in a 3-1 flyer or something? I wouldn't hate gnawing Crescendo if they do, because then we get a couple points of extra damage in, and we get a rat token to replace whatever they kill. Feed the Cauldron. They go for that at instant speed rather than the main phase. They could have another food token if they did it main phase, but then they don't get to play around stuff. So that's fair. Honestly, I think I do Crescendo here, because otherwise I'm not doing anything with my mana. So let's get an extra four points of damage in and get a rat. Just Crescendo to basically bolt them and put a rat on the board. Not the greatest Crescendo of all time, but this was part of the flaw of these cards I was talking about, where if you draw too many of these instead of more threats, you get into these kind of awkward positions here that could stack up poorly for us. There's a Hopeless Nightmare. Okay, so they're essentially at 12 life because of the um, the food over there. I can Nightmare them down to essentially 10 and Apple the Scavenger. So then they're at 10 life. I have Triggered Celebration and I hit for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I can put them to 1 and then hope they don't have any more food. But I don't have the mana to play Hopeless Nightmare and throw a Tempting Apple at them. If I just Tempting Apple and throw the Apple, that also doesn't kill them because I don't trigger Celebration, if that's the only thing I do. Because I just Apple this, I hit for 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then 3 more, I hit for 11 when they're essentially at 12. So either way, I put them to 1. I suppose... The Hopeless Nightmare Tempting Apple weighs a little better. We're definitely doing one of them. I guess... I don't know, I like that this makes them ditch a, a spell immediately, but if we did this the other way around, then they wouldn't see the extra 2 damage next turn coming, which is kind of a benefit. If I just sacked the apple here then they wouldn't know that I have another direct 2 damage of burn coming to them later. Oh, they're just going to concede? I mean, that's fair enough. They're not dead on board, but they might not be conceding because they think they're dead on board. They might be conceding because they know what their hand is. They know if they have more food tokens or not. And it is going to take quite a bit to stabilize here since I'll still have three attackers left over after this turn with them at one life. So we are now 5-0 and o heading into game number six. But at this point, whatever happens from here, we are up in gems. We're in the money today at 1,600 gems out of the 1,500 gem draft plus four additional packs. So sweet, sweet draft for today heading into game six. Here we are for game six with a pretty beautiful hand here. We're on the draw again. We've been on the play once so far. One day, one day she will return to me, I believe. For now, we're going to be playing Edge Ball in as a black source, and then we've got perfect mana. Turn two Grand Ball Guest into the Butcher turn three for celebration. We've got the Cell Sword already with two treason effects in this deck to steal our opponent's creatures. We could draw into some nice late game plays. Our opponent's going to start off with a Red Tooth Vanguard. Speaking of things that we could draw into, we've got a couple rat outs that would love to say hello to that Red Tooth Vanguard. Actually, drawing one next turn would be perfect because then I can play Rat Out and Ball Guest in the same turn. Playing against a green-white deck here, though, which means they might have a lot of 
uh, auras, a lot of those roll tokens to make this a two toughness card. They just play a Verdant Outrider for now. We do not find a rat out. Sadness on the stack. Uh, let's butcher it up. That gives us a 2-3 blocker to trade into one of these and a 1-1 one, one rat to send in. We might have to get a little on the defensive here, which is awkward, but that's kind of what happens when you're on the draw. Let's drop a butcher and a rat. Jam in for three. No trade from our opponent. Send in the team. Green-white has a million combat tricks. The worst for me would be if they have the plus one, plus one trample roll. Because then if I block the Outrider, they put the plus one, plus one trample roll onto it. They kill my Butcher without me doing anything with it. And if I trade Butcher into Vanguard, then... They could still do the plus one plus one roll and get the vanguard back from grave. I guess they'd need two more mana, so they would need a fourth land. I guess we probably go to vanguard to play around the plus one plus one trick. Because if it's anything that actually costs them a spell, it's not that bad for me. But if it's an adventure combat trick, that's where we really get got. Where they spend half a card to kill my thing. The thing that's sad about doing it this way is obviously we're killing the smaller creature and a creature that could come back. There's a regal bunnycorn from our opponent and more mana for us. We are ditching that to this witch's mark. A single green source from our opponent being held up here. I am not really um, worried about my opponent blowing up my creature in response to witch's mark with one green mana, so... Switches mark up the rat so I can attack in for damage even if I want to hold up a blocker, which could be the end result of my draws, we'll see. Hmm. Spiteful Hex Mage is the draw. Do not love that. Okay. I guess the other benefit of putting the roll on the rat means that the rat's big enough to trade into Outrider off of the burn together next turn if I want to do that. I mean, I could do it right now, but not in love with that line. 13 life. We're taking six on the crackback right now. I've got a fling out of nowhere. This might be overly aggressive. But I think I do this, and then I trade just one ball guest on blocks, maybe. They're stuck enough on mana from just missing a land drop here that if they spend two mana to give one of these plus one plus one instead of um, playing another creature, that's decent for us. Although, they're at 12 life. Eight power on board if I trigger Celebration, which I can do off of a Hex Mage by itself. Hold up. We could absolutely kill them in just one attack, so. No blocks. It is the Werefox. That is what I believed. And there's Tempting Apple. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Or, sorry, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yep. So, whoa, Auto Tapper. Oh my god, we almost lost the Auto Tapper. Uh, my plan for lethal was going to be like celebrating with these creatures and then attacking them with everybody and then flinging like a rat at them or something. But if we draw a tempting apple, that makes it so much easier. I don't actually know if the math adds up to where we would have had lethal without the. Um, the tempting apple. But uh, the math's irrelevant because we luck sacked into it, so. We are just strolling through this draft, 6-0 and oh now, very far in the money, heading into the final boss with two extra rounds in the chamber, three possible runs at our final battle. Here we are for round 7, the final battle with our opponent on the play. We've got a spear guard into a ball guest, into stab wound if we hit a third mana. But if we miss for a turn or two, we still have a second ball guest to play. Turn three. 
We do want to get all the way up to four mana here with Mary Bards in hand, but the hand is definitely not a mulligan. Our opponent's hand, on the other hand, is indeed. They do take a mulligan. All right, a mulligan to six it is, and they're going to start with a forest past the turn. We're going to get that spear guard out immediately, and we're going to draw that swamp immediately, so we will have three mana on turn three. Still pretty likely to just play another ball guest on that turn, but we've got other options. Ooh, Beanstalk Worm. So they have three mana out on their turn two while I just have one mountain sitting there since we're on the draw. Could explode in my face, but on the plus side, Beanstalk Worm is not straight ramp where it like draws you a card worth of value. It's just letting you play the lands that you already have slightly faster. So they are going to run out of cards dumping all their hand all of their lands out immediately, even if it means they'll be playing really big creatures on me really quickly. Um, I think it's still going to be uh, fine, because they're going to run out of cards, and we can still try to win this game by having more gas to play around with than them. Uh, even if I put a Wicked Roll on Spear Guard, it doesn't attack in well, so we'll just put... A little bit of overkill on the Grand Ball Guest. Have it attack it as a 4-4 four, four instead of a 3-3 three, three here. Next turn, we're definitely playing the Merry Bards. We get to trigger both Guests by doing so. Then we can attack in with both, because I can put the Young Hero roll onto this one, and they'll both attack in as 4-4 four, four threats, even into their 5-4 blocker. Unless our opponent passes the turn with 5 mana up without casting anything, then they're probably just playing like Instant Speed Removal or something, I guess? Which is fine, they kill one of the ball guests, I guess. Yeah, I still do the same thing, and now we just have a stab wound the turn they play the beanstalk worm, I guess. Just make the, the beanstalk worm a little smaller. Feed the cauldron? Okay. Well... That's pretty cool with me. Still getting our three damage here. We're gonna play the Beanstalk Worm now. Are they just trying to play around our infinite uh, Tempting Apple plays that we've been killing everybody else with? Maybe that's what it is. Joke's on them, I don't even have the Tempting Apple this game. But maybe that's what it is. They just didn't want to put a big creature down and just get it stolen for a turn by the uh, the Wicked Fealty or whatever. Twisted Fealty. Or a Tempting Apple. But yeah, Instant Speed Feed the Cauldron's extra weird. I guess it's so that they could get rid of any, any rolls we try to put anywhere. Which worked on the Merry Bards, but... Still, Sorcery Speed Feed the Cauldron would have been kill one of the guests and gain three life. Although, I do think this stacked up into being a little better for them because of uh, us specifically having the Merry Bards there. So I can cast one spell. They're at 11 life here. I could just stab wound the Witch Stalker and hang out. For a while. I don't hate it. If I'm trying to use the stab wound to kill the beanstalk worm, I'm turning it in, into a 3-2. So they still trade witch stalker into merry bards and ball guest into beanstalk worm, and then I'm just out of creatures regardless. I guess the one issue with putting stab wound on witch stalker is then witch stalker is small enough that they could rat out their own witch stalker, which I don't love. So maybe I still stab wound the Beanstalk Worm and they just don't attack. Yeah, that's fine. The thing that I do like about stab wounding the Witch Stalker is I'm stab wounding a defender and a smaller creature. I guess the Witch Stalker does buff itself up to be an attacker, but it would be like a one power attacker every turn. Curse of the Werefox, pretty disgusting there. Kills one of our creatures and gets rid of the stab wound. That is beautiful. 
Speaking of cards that are pretty disgusting there, though, Voracious Vermin's an excellent draw. So if they trade into my Merry Bards, they make my Vermin bigger. If they clear out the Spear Guard, they make my Vermin bigger. It makes our attacks beautiful. Yep, and now we are getting... Kind of reaping the rewards of their... Their mulligan early here, where they have just run out of stuff. And we probably just jam in. We'll see, one spell left. Could be the rare that lets them exile creatures from their grave and give everything minus X, minus X, but it's an area that's tempting Apple where this is certainly not the position they want that in. Still gives them another turn because they can eat it and go to 10. Never mind. Literally just never didn't have it today. This was a big day for variants. I've certainly made some relatively large misplays today. Not a massive amount of them, but enough that uh, in a very average run of variants, I think we would have gone probably 4-3 or something here. But there's those days that you play really, really well and just get punished by variants and still lose anyway. And there's the days where you play poorly and you get rewarded by variants. Sometimes you just get lucky. You just are the luck sack. And today is really our day at 7 and 0 oh with this deck. Again, not saying that this is a deck that can't 7 0. Oh. It's the gameplay where we really faltered here, but it just did not matter. We drew like a champion and uh, hit all our bombs and stuff when we wanted them. Yeah. Super, super happy with the deck. Not too much to say here. We've played a lot of these Red Black Rat aggro style decks. A little bit lower on the rats in this deck than uh, most of them. Not a ton of that. That made the Hex Mage a slight underperformer where we had it one or two times uh, without a 1-1 one -one to put the roll onto. Uh, but still putting the roll on the Grand Ball Guest that one time was fine. Um, and I think the other time I drew it, I just didn't even need to cast it because we were already killing them, so... Pretty solid stuff. Great work from the edge ball in. Great work from the edge ball in being able to pick up the Callus Cell Sword to get another fling to finish that one opponent off. Wouldn't have needed to do that, I think, uh, if I played that game out correctly and got my celebration trigger on the ball guest. So I guess uh, some solid picks during the draft do help make up for some loose plays during the gameplay. I think the deck itself is pretty great, but it also drew quite well. And we will grab that 7-0. Grab our prizes. That is going to be 2,200 gems and six packs of Wilds of Eldraine. So some big stuff for the prizes. And before I log off, I'm going to double check. Chromatic Cube is still not live on Arena at the time of this recording. Um, again, the weekly MTG announcements for the past two weeks have said that Chromatic Cube would be up November 2nd until... Um, November 14th or something, from November 2nd until the launch of Lost Caverns of Ixalan. So, uh, yeah, I will be doing those as soon as they're up, but maybe they were a week off. Maybe they meant November 9th. That would be a bit of a bummer. So I don't know what we'll be doing tomorrow, but as always, it's going to be some more Magic Arena, probably some more drafts of some kind. But that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video and you're interested in seeing more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel and the link in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.